A very warm welcome to everybody. My name is Stella Dawson. I am an economic journalist and the former head of communications at CGAP, and I will be moderating this session on the future of medium and small size enterprises in the digital economy. Our goal in this session is to think through how we can best prepare MSEs for the digital world so that they can adapt and thrive. And we want to think of it not just about today or tomorrow, but look 10 years out at how they can adapt. We will be doing that by examining the current environment and then look at three potential business models that we see emerging and discuss and consider the implications and strategies that we can deploy to, in order to improve the outcomes for MSEs and mitigate potential harm. So let me introduce you to our excellent panel of specialists who are joining in this discussion. We have from Nigeria, Stephen Ambore. He is head of digital financial services at the Central Bank of Nigeria. Welcome, Stephen. In London, Pale Delal, she is the senior vice president of social impact at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Welcome, Pale. And Javier Faz, he's lead specialist on technology and business models in digital finance at CGAP here in Washington. Hi, Javier. And you, the audience, are an essential part of this conversation. I invite you to post into chat your comments, questions, and ideas, and we'll endeavor throughout to include those in the discussion. So let's begin to set the stage. Oops, I think, I think I'm sharing. Uh, just checking with you all that you can see. <laughs> um, one second, I, I... I'm sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. I will be right with you. I'm sharing my screen. Share screen. My apologies. Excellent, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, so it goes without saying that MSCs play an absolutely critical role throughout the uh, economy for millions and millions of people. But why do they matter? They're the major employer in developing and uh, developed countries alike. They provide half of all jobs. They make up 90% of all businesses. And in emerging economies, their output represents at least 40% of GDP. And if one was able to count the informal sector, that number would be even higher. Many families depend entirely on MSEs to supplement their income or for their whole income. And let's remember that small businesses are vital sources of creation and innovation and in the dynamic economy. So supporting MSEs is absolutely critical to GDP growth. And yet we see that MSEs are under severe stress at this moment, particularly in developing economies. The global pandemic has thrown many of them out of business. McKinsey has been studying this and they found that between February 2020 and April 2021, between 70 and 80% of MSEs across 32 countries lost up to 50% of their revenues. The Center for Financial Inclusion has done some similar research. It looked at four emerging economies, Colombia, Nigeria, India, and Indonesia. And it found that almost half, 44% of them, could not cover their business expenses with the revenues that they were bringing in. In that time period, about 15% of them closed and 22% were dealing with declining profits. And we've also seen that the gender gap has widened throughout the pandemic. The CFI work identified that male-owned businesses reported that uh, about 80% of them saw their profits either staying the same or increasing, whereas one third of women-owned businesses said that they were suffering. They engaged in a number of coping strategies. About a third sold assets and a third provided credit customers. 50% of MSEs were taking out loans and about half offering discounts, because you can see how heavily this has hit their margins. And those that did adapt um, to digital strategies 
they saw some successes. And this was extremely encouraging. A number of MSCs turned to social marketing in order to stay in touch with their customers. And that enabled them to keep their customer base, even if they were still doing physical delivery and cash payments. Those that actually sold on digital platforms saw, saw their profits increase through the pandemic. Very encouraging. However, only 12% of MSEs surveyed by CFI actually engaged in this as a strategy. But perhaps most surprising through all of this, the narrative that we have heard is that the global pandemic had increased the turn to digital, particularly as governments sent out uh, relief payments using digital payment mechanisms. Despite that, we're finding that cash remains extremely sticky. And in some regards, there's been a slip back to using cash more and more. People are not picking up and using those digital tools despite the, uh, the, the pandemic and the greater usage of them and the greater availability of them. So this leads to three general conclusions that I would draw about the condition of MSE sector today. Many MSEs have come out of this pandemic in a weakened financial condition. Their savings have been depleted, they're laden with debt, their profits are down. Secondly, the promise of the digital economy is proving far more elusive than we had expected. E-commerce is showing its potential, but I'd wager that it demands some fresh thinking on our part about ways to support digital adoption, not just for consumers, but also for the MSEs themselves. And discouragingly, a number of old problems continue to persist. Access to credit is a significant issue for MSEs. The UN estimates that 40% uh, of businesses are in need of credit. And we're looking at something on the scale of a $5.2 trillion annual financing gap for MSEs in developing countries. And on the other side, we also have a lack of trust in digital, which has that potential to make access to credit so much easier. Concerns over cybersecurity, data farming, a lack of complaints mechanism, consumer protection, all of these are hampering the switch to digital. So that's the backdrop that we are facing today for the MSC environment. And before we look at what the future might hold for them, I'd like to take a look at three key forces. These are macroeconomic pressures that they also are facing that need to shape our discussion. Climate change, we all know about climate change, but let me give you a few statistics that are quite sobering. Extreme heat will make conditions unlivable for one third of the global population uh, by 2050. And it will put about 70% of the world food supply at risk by 2045. In developing countries, rising sea levels are going to put entire cities underwater. And this when more and more people are moving to cities. And nine of the 10 most affected countries are in Africa. This means poverty is going to increase. We're looking at estimates for 100 million more people to fall into poverty by the end of the decade alone due to climate change. And then of course there's demographic change, much of it driven by climate change. The UN is estimating that between 25 million and maybe as many as 1 billion people are going to be migrating. Urbanization is increasing, already it's about 55% and we'll get close to 70% by 2050. The aging crisis is expanding from the Western developed world into other parts of East and Southeast Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean. And then on the other hand, we have a youth explosion in Africa and parts of Asia. Uh, half of the global growth in pop population by 2050 will be concentrated in eight lesser developed countries in Africa and Asia. And finally, the technological change is accelerating. This, we're moving toward a highly connected world, disruptive business environment. And yet, despite that growth and 5G coverage which is expected to reach 80% of people, we still have half of the world's population that doesn't have access to an internet. And this, a number that really surprised me is that most of those are women. They are the digitally excluded and also rural areas. And, we, and another thing to bear in mind is the rise in data protectionism and data localization that creates new challenges for switching to a digital environment. 
And finally, a medium term force that I think we should also bear in mind that stressing MSEs considerably right now is global inflation. A number of factors have led to this, supply chain crisis, the war in Ukraine, cheap money decade. Uh, inflation is squeezing the already slender profits for MSEs. It's making it difficult for them to raise prices when many of their economies are heading toward recession. So overall, an extremely challenging environment for MSEs to operate in today. So let's take a look in this very fast changing world. What are the business models that we see emerging that the MSEs must navigate? The first, I think we're most familiar with, and that's the one dominated by corporate platforms. We're talking about the likes of Uber, Amazon, Instacart who dominate. They dominate their particular market sector, highly competitive, they control much of the pricing power. In this environment, MSEs face little choice but to sell on a large platform, and you're likely to see race to bottom on prices in order to compete. The MSEs and also the gig workers who engage in these, they face hefty fees to participate in the platform and have little control over pricing and margins can be very small. A different environment that we see emerging in some countries, I'm thinking India in particular, is one driven by open networks. This is somewhere where you, there's a strong central government that seeks to level the playing field for all of the players uh, by opening up data sharing platforms with the idea that they can create equal opportunity for everyone to compete in a seamless digital economy. So in an open network environment, an MSE can sign up once, which simplifies the process of entry into the platform economy. They can access a comprehensive suite of services, particularly thanks to open APIs. There's a digital payment system that's readily available to all. And there's innovative digital solutions for things such as inventory management tools, logistics managements, all readily available. So a leveling, a flattening of the environment with the idea that power is more evenly distributed amongst the players. And then thirdly, we're seeing some inklings of uh, what might be called platform cooperatives that could emerge. And this is really where workers become empowered by the MSEs themselves, the merchants and the gig workers seek to take back some control from the corporate platforms. Now, where are we seeing this in the unionization moves? We've seen in Fedora in Canada, uh, Uber in San Francisco has been moving toward unionization, and also some signs of trying to take back control from gig workers who have staged walkouts at Instacart or Shipt, um, or even Uber drivers who use WhatsApp to coordinate staying off the platform to push up prices. So we're speculating that from this, we might start to see some of the merchants aligning and the gig workers aligning on a common vision of a platform where the cooperative itself would set the rules and the fees for the members that participate. The cooperative negotiates, negotiates more favorable terms with the suppliers. And this in turn will help improve the, mer uh, the margins for merchants. So these are the three scenarios that we think potentially could emerge in the new economy for MSEs to consider navigating a decade out. So as we launch the discussion, I'd like to invite you as the audience to uh, participate in a poll and vote on what you think is likely to be the predominant uh, business model that emerges 10 years from now. So please, um, use the poll and we'll come back to the results momentarily. Meanwhile, let me invite the panelists to give their reactions. So how realistic do you see these three scenarios and tell us uh, what you see emerging, where and why that dynamic is moving forward in the marketplace? Javier, could I start with you? Uh, yes, thank you. Um... Stella, I, I think the three scenarios that you mentioned are really very interesting um, pictures of where the markets could evolve 10 years out into the future. Uh, I think they're very useful because they force us to think what is at play and what are the key aspects that might change um, in the next decade as markets evolve. 
uh, and how this might play out for the MSEs. Um, I think specifically in these three scenarios, uh, you can see particularly how the balance of power might change based on different factors. One thing that stands out for me is that the path to the digital economy that you were describing where e-commerce is widespread and uh, MSEs have access to participate in different platforms and to sell online and customers are transacting digitally. That scenario, um, while it is very clear that in some countries it's pretty much happening, in other countries it's pretty much ways off. So for instance, uh, if you think of India, Indonesia, Nigeria, Colombia, Mexico, uh, e-commerce is, 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 is very well, it's a sector that is emerging, it's thriving. So you can see pretty much these scenarios playing out somehow in the future. But for many other countries, uh, there's a lot of things that stand in the way for e-commerce to really um, flourish. Um, so I think as we think to the future, we need to think broadly and see and consider um, um, a, a broader perspective in the way we understand and, and think about these scenarios. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, uh, do you agree? Do you see the corporate model as the one that's taking hold in the uh, countries that are a little bit more advanced in the digital economy? And what does that mean for the other scenarios? Well, um, again, um, looking at these scenarios, uh, uh, basically you begin to see stakeholders that are really driving this or that will really be impacted, uh, looking at the corporates, um, the platform themselves, and where government is involved um, in the open market, and then the participant themselves in the um, um, cooperative um, 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 style. What we've seen is uh, basically when platform comes, they tend to address um, challenges that will facilitate um, MSEs, um, like we've seen in Nigeria, um, there are a lot of gaps in the market and when they come, they come into the market, um, they tend to close um, 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 these gaps, you know, and government generally try to provide enabling environment. Like um, in, in Nigeria, for instance, what did government have done in, um, in the financial services space um, they've deliberately in the financial inclusion strategy um, provided for a level playing ground, basically bringing in all uh, players to address um, issue. And they're trying to align that to um, a national um, strategy um, to give that um, um, perspective. Um, now, um, players are coming in, but there are environmental issues that will tend towards platform cooperative. Um, for instance, um, in developing economies like Nigeria, there are issues of exchange rate stability. And globally now we're talking of um, um, energy crisis and increased um, prices in, in energy. So this participant will start to question and want to take certain actions and need to push to you know, this cooperative uh, uh, move. So they're all happening in bit. Um, government is excited that this is expanding the economic base. The players are seeing new opportunities, uh, but in the end, there are going to be conversations that will be, drive, that will be driven by environmental um, happenings like we're beginning to see with energy prices and, and what is happening um, driven again by um, the conflict in um, Russia and Ukraine. Thank you. Yeah, so a very dynamic uh, uh, situation in Nigeria where you've got different uh, players at different stages experimenting. Very interesting. Pale, what are you seeing? Yeah, I, so I'd make just a couple of points. The first is that we have to really think about the impact of these digital platforms on the micro and small enterprises themselves. The truth is that these digital platforms can help micro and small businesses succeed, but they can also enable their failure. And so we really have to think about how these digital platforms intersect with small businesses and their operations. So, so that's my first point, that there's opportunity, but there's also risk. The second, which I think was, was um, to complement a point Stephen made, is that not all micro and small businesses are equal. And those that are kind of institutionally underserved, that kind of sense of disenfranchisement is even more exacerbated on the digital platform. So we have to think proactively about underserved populations. And then the third point I just make is, I think, especially when you think about scenario two, Stella, 
Um, I think that's there's so much opportunity and potential, but thinking about data principles and data responsibility is going to be key to really make sure that we're um, protecting micro and small businesses as much as we're enabling them and their resiliency. So would you say then that there tends to be a trend toward the corporate model unless there's an interjection be it from the government or from the workers in order to disrupt that power dynamic of consolidating at the corporate level? Is that what the scenario we might be looking at? I think we're already at scenario one. I think we that is what we're living. Digital platforms play a central role. And I think the challenge of this reality is that the bigger businesses, so the medium-sized businesses are the ones that are really benefiting, and the smaller and the micro are being the ones are the ones that are being farther left behind. And so this is where I think we are, but I think we have opportunity to make it better. What about a rebalancing of power. Exactly. Um, Excellent. That, that, that's really helpful to see it that way. Um, so given that we're, we, we agree that we're headed in that direction, but you need to rebalance power in order to give more strength to the MSEs, what then are the incentives for um, the platforms themselves to actually bring MSEs into do you want to pick that one up? Pam? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we have to recognize that the success of small businesses is interdependent with the success of platforms and the success of the platforms and the profitability of platforms is also interdependent on the profitability of the micro and small businesses that are on it. So there's this real symbiotic relationship. And so I don't think digital platforms can afford to ignore those who are, that, are, that are part of their ecosystem. And they really do need to prioritize those that are underserved, those MSCs that are underserved. I think the other real opportunity that's not quite happening, Stella, is that at the moment, we still see micro and small enterprises as a monolith, and we're not really thinking about strategic segmentation. So we're not thinking about the different hurdles and barriers that women-owned or led small businesses will face, or those that are rural-based, or those that are um, supported by minority businesses or minorities. So we have to think about we have to think strategically about segmentation. And I think that's a real opportunity for platforms, again, to make sure that there's no major segment that's left behind and making sure that the digital economy really works for all micro and small businesses, just not the few. Yeah, Javier, I know that you've done quite a bit of work in China, which I think is a very interesting example of a country that where uh, the big platforms actually adopted a strategy of going out into the rural communities in order to solicit the small businesses to participate in the platforms. What did they do and how successful were they in getting them on board? Yeah, um, I, we did some research, some field research in, in the province of Shandong in Eastern China. Uh, we really wanted to look and to see the extent to which Taobao had really penetrated uh, rural community and villages and the way in which farmers were actually participating in e-commerce and what was the process that led to that. And one thing we observed was that uh, very broad, and, and we, we saw this across villages very broadly, that um, there was a huge gap, of course, at the beginning for farmers to be able to participate in a digital platform, right? For, for farmers, selling in a market was completely different than selling online. Um, and there was a huge need to build capacity to create a storefront, to manage um, a, a digital process, getting orders online, managing fulfillment, all that um, uh, requires significant um, change in, in the way they did business. Um, and what happened was Taobao very early on they invested in creating centers at the community level uh, to create those capacities, to familiarize people, not only farmers, but uh, uh, small entrepreneurs, very small businesses, uh, in how these tools uh, work, how to create your storefront, um, um, manage your, your sales, uh, manage questions from your uh, target uh, uh, segment, and so on. Um, and this really worked over time. The small entrepreneurs and farmers were able to, to sell online. Now, this was the initial part of the story. 
um, what happened over time is that um, having access to a larger market meant that they were able to have many more different kinds of customers buying those products. Uh, so what used to be a commodity eventually turned into a variety of more specialized products with higher margins. Um, and that allowed the small entrepreneurs to hire a digital person, a, a niece, a son, somebody in the family that was more familiar with digital tools um, who could focus on managing the digital sales and the farmers would focus on managing the digital, I'm sorry, the, the, the production of goods. Um, so it was a very interesting process. Um, but going back to your to to the question and, and some of the points Payal made, uh, you, this investment was needed uh, because the success of the platform was based on the success of, of the small entrepreneurs and, and, and the businesses that were operating uh, on it. Mm -hmm. So the investment by the big corporate platforms in order to bring uh, the MSEs into that new environment. Uh, Stephen, um, you have, uh, as, as you described, a very interesting situation there and see that um, incentivizing the corporations alone is not enough. Uh, tell me about what actions you've been taking for government intervention in order to help stimulate more of the platforms bringing on the MSEs. Uh, um, um, thank you very much. And, and that indeed um, is, is very, very important um, that right from the very beginning, um, government look at um, such platforms as a tool for economic growth and development. And that's what we've done um, in Nigeria. And we've gone ahead to develop um, a digital economy um, strategy. So the objective of this strategy is just basically looking at um, the players in this digital economy, including the platforms the benefit they can bring and the risks um, um, that they pose are really driving um, for, for collaboration through this um, because for MSCs, um, um, if this is really done well, they can leverage on this platform to grow, uh, you know, much more than they've ever uh, done before. Again, um, we know that there are risks. Um, another issue that, 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 that needs to come quickly um, to that um, is um, consumer protection regulation and then competition as well um, for market conduct. Um, because um, what we've seen, um, even though the research we did was to, for digital financial um, um, services, uh, we've seen that even though there are traditional um, frameworks for market conduct and consumer protections, when it comes to um, digital economy and, 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 and all that related, it is not really um, engraved in a lot of um, countries. And that is really very important. And indeed, it is important to look at um, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable segments um, persons with disability and, and, and gender as well. Um, in Nigeria, we have a gender gap of um, around 90%. So what we're doing is we're developing a strategy that will make uh, that, that will improve accessibility um, to, to women-based businesses, um, to um, um, digital platforms, to credit um, um, and, and all that. And again, we're promoting um, innovation and that's why we launched um, INERA um, at uh, CBDC, um, recently basically encouraging um, MSMEs to leverage um, innovation so that they can really participate in a beneficial way um, um, in the digital um, um, economy. So there's a lot. Um, I think um, a government needs to be very deliberate um, in taking the advantages of the digital economy to enable M MSME growth and then economic growth at large and, and mitigate um, the risks. Basically look at um, existing policies on how to improve them um, to handle this, um, let me call them new entrants. Thank you. Excellent. Um, very important role government's playing there, and you've touched on a number of issues. Uh, governments, though, um, can do it by dictate or they can do it by the cooperation with the private sector. Pale, how does this uh, have to be managed between leaving it to the marketplace to sort out and the government intervention? Where's the balance there? Yeah, I think governments play a really important role, Stella. And the way I think about it is that governments create 
a positive entrepreneurial environment and they have a duty to do so. So I think there's opportunity for government to ensure, especially if we're thinking about the digital economy, there's opportunity for the government to really invest in public goods like connectivity and internet access. But I think there's also an important role the government plays in terms of making it easy for entrepreneurs to do business and to set up businesses. Um, we recently ran a poll um, among entrepreneurs in a certain EU country and 75% of the small businesses came back to us and said, our number one barrier is how difficult it is to actually do all the paperwork our government requires to keep our business open. And this is really making us reconsider whether we want to be entrepreneurs. And so I think the government has a real role in making sure that the environment is favorable, that the processes and requirements are easy, and really helping simplify the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Because right now, if you're an entrepreneur, you have so many pressures um, that are facing you. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity for government to not be one of those pressures. Let me bring in some of the reactions we're getting from the audience. Uh, firstly, the poll, which I think is very interesting. You collectively have said that you think that, we, that inevitably there's a a move toward, albeit along a continuum, toward the corporate platform model. But in our poll, looking a decade out, the audience says about 58% think that corporate platform model it will be the dominant one. 21% say open networks and 21% say worker empowered. Now that surprises me. Does it surprise you, Javier? Uh, no, in a way, um, in countries where e-commerce has emerged and evolved for a decade already, uh, that's what we see today. So um, it's not a surprise to think, you know, it would be different in other, in other countries. And as I said before, in emerging markets, there are many other things at play um, in, in terms of just getting e-commerce up and running and making it um, an opportunity where micro entrepreneurs can actually participate on realistically. So I think uh, maybe if we were talking about 20 years from now, uh, perhaps maybe the answer might have been differently. But um, yeah, that'd be my view. That makes fun. Yeah. Um, and I've got a really good question from Jayshree here. Given the balance of power is skewed toward large platforms today, how do we ensure that MSCs have the choice to switch platforms and reduce dependencies in a platform that they signed up to? And is there a future where their business consumer credit history can be carried without disruption to their business from one platform to the other. Um, would you, who would like to tackle that one? Would you like to, Javier? Yeah, um, so one of the big problems uh, in addition to the balance of power is also the issue of discoverability. In, in a scenario where a lot of um, enterprises have the opportunity to participate in an e-commerce platform, um, you might have hundreds of providers offering a, a similar product. So the larger uh, and more established products would be the ones that tend to be recognized by customers and the smaller ones would actually face barriers to sell their, their products. Even though they're participating in a platform, uh, it's not equitable access to market. Uh, so there's more to the balance of power, and there's an interesting um, there's an interesting initiative in India. It's not led by the government. Uh, it's more on the industry side, and it's experimental. It's not proven, but the idea it, it's called Open Networks uh, for Digital Commerce, and the idea is to create a series of protocols and standards that enable the interconnection of platforms. You were alluding to that, Estella, in your um, description of, of one of the scenarios. And, and that you know, makes it real, right? The interconnection of platforms would allow any customer logging into a particular e-commerce platform to actually find a product that is sold through a different uh, platform. So that would uh, help rebalance a little bit in some way the balance of power. And it would also aim at help the discoverability of products because it would allow more specialized searches to bring up more specialized providers. It could take into account also the geographic location. Uh, so if you're searching for a particular item, um, maybe you would have access to a national market, but probably you would prioritize what is closer to you. Um, so there's there's a that might be a game changer and it's something to 
look into uh, in more detail um, in, in terms of how it might affect that, that power balance and the outcomes for uh, micro entrepreneurs. Mm. Oh, very interesting. Um, uh, let me um, turn to you, Stephen, and uh, can you uh, tell us what experience you've had? Do you have any evidence that MSCs on their platforms in Nigeria are they actually seeing improvements in their income? What, 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 what can you tell us on that front? One of our audience is very keen to know uh, if MSCs actually are better off on the platforms. All right, uh, um, thank you very much. Very interesting um, um, question. Um, to the extent that um, um, the platform has opened up MSCs to more markets, um, even though um, th there's a talk about margin, um, th there's a talk about charges, um, but to the level that it has opened up um, to a larger market, um, they are getting to get more um, more, more revenue. Um, you know, but initially we spoke around um, issues that are happening, and then um, the third model around cooperative. They'll very soon start discussing um, how to handle the issues that are there. You know, uh, no, there's no hiding away from it. Um, digital platforms um, they are they are they are favored um, with the balance of power for a lot of reasons. Um, you know. They, they, they gain data more and more and develop more um, um, business models that will help them to serve uh, um, at, at even a cheaper rate, you know. But where we are now, um, MSMEs that are plugging into it um, are getting more revenues because of, um, um, you know, um, the reach to more um, um, markets. It will be interesting how this pans out um, in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, and I I'll come to you just to two seconds, Pam. I just point to the CFI research that was recently published that showed that those MSEs that did fully engage in digital commerce on the platforms during the pan pandemic saw their uh, revenues increase, which was extremely encouraging. It was just that not many of them did, which speaks to the issue of how do you get more onto the platforms pale. Yeah, sorry, Stella. I just wanted to add that we've seen in our work that yes, um, from a from an economics perspective, it's a net positive when small businesses get on digital platforms. And to Javier's point, because there is margin compression, there's increased value add and specialization, um, which which is really really helpful. The other thing that we have seen is the opportunity, and one of the things we're trying to really champion, especially in Latin America is the opportunity of embedded finance because the, the participation on these digital platforms generates data, which then gives lenders a little bit more comfort and helps de-risk micro and small businesses. So to, to your earlier point about the massive access to finance gap, I think this is where digital platforms could be really helpful and competitive in terms of generating data to help de-risk lending to micro and small businesses. Um, and then the final point I just make on this is that one of the things we're trying to do is in partnership with Common Sense Lab at Duke, we're trying to create behavioral nudges, nudges to micro and small entrepreneurs on digital platforms. So at the moment we're working with Mercado Libre in Mexico, so that when an entrepreneur has a larger than normal sale, they get nudged to save, save a little bit. Um, and for us, this idea of savings is really incredibly important as we're thinking about financial resilience and financial health of micro and small businesses. So I think that's another opportunity to kind of create these just-in-time cues to really, again, get small businesses to think a little bit differently in their financial management. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, pick up that point about credit a little bit more. Uh, Javier, I know you've done some work on how the data generation, once you participate in a platform, can enable more financial service providers to uh, uh, use that data to evaluate whether to extend credit. To what extent are we seeing that happening? And is it really starting to fill the financing gap? And if not, why not? Yeah, um, I think there's two things to take into consideration. One is when micro entrepreneurs have access to working capital loans. Um, we've seen uh, evidence in different contexts that they are that there is an increase in sales. So often sales are limited by the by the uh, limited available capital. So when you have access to loans to expand that working capital, then you can sell more. Um, so the fact that you can sell more and that the data reflects digital transactional data reflects more accurately the capacity to pay a loan than the kind of finance that micro-entrepreneurs can have is better finance than 
standard on collateralized loans or, or collateralized by other kinds of assets. So as, essentially uh, what this means is that um, it, it's, a, it's a total you know, positive uh, um, outcome for the micro entrepreneur to participate in digital sales, either through digital platforms or otherwise. And okay. we are seeing this across uh, um, digit, uh, you know, uh, fintechs that are digitizing um, the, the finance for MSCs across Africa, South Asia, East Asia, and Latin America. We're, we're seeing it all across. Um, Stephen, I'd, I'd like to turn to you to talk a little bit more about what experience you've been having with the eNaira. Um, so I'd like to expand the conversation into how we can get more of the uh, MSEs into the digital platforms. And one of the uh, issues that you raised was the uh, lack of trust in the, the digital uh, systems. And that by introducing the eNARA, you were, I, if I correct me if I'm wrong, you are hoping that this will increase trust in the currency and get more people familiar with using digital payments and then they can transfer to the MSEs into more of a digital platform environment. Could you explain how that's going? Yeah, uh, um, thank you very much. Um, just a little bit of um, a context. Um, in Nigeria, um, there are 38.1 million people that are financially excluded and do not have access to financial services. Um, we publish a mobile money um, guideline um, in 2012, but unfortunately, unlike what happened in East Africa, um, the penetration in Nigeria was not great. Um, as a matter of fact, um, in 2018, we did a survey and it showed penetration around was around 3.03, um, uh, which is not really great. Um, of course, in 2020, uh, when we did, it went up to um, 28%. Um, percent. Um, so there's a huge um, financial inclusion gap, low penetration of digital financial services, even though among the financially excluded, we've seen um, that 89% of the financially excluded either had their mobile phone or had access um, to mobile phone. And that's on one side. On the other side, um, Nigeria is one of the top um, 10 countries always when it comes to rem um, diaspora remittances. Um, but cost of remittances uh, for sub-Saharan Africa is, is particularly high. Um, so with these things in mind and with some other use cases, uh, we looked at leveraging um, in-era um, to address um, um, some of the challenges um, 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 that we are facing in, in Nigeria. And um, the biggest beneficiaries we believe um, in this will be um, the merchant, um, the MSCs, uh, they are doing um, um, business because it's meant to be um, cheaper in terms of transaction costs. Um, in terms of trust, um, this has um, the backing of the central bank uh, behind it. It's, it's a bit different um, from other um, DFS providers um, um, in town. Um, so at, at first, when it comes, it comes with, with the backing of the central bank, which is good when you communicate um, to the people in the, in the interland because one key reason for low adoption of digital financial services has been trust, you know, uh, because there, there's been a lot out there. Apart from the regulated space, there are a lot of other services that come from the unregulated space. Um, it's, it's, it's not always possible for MSCs to know which one is regulated and which one um, is not regulated. So it's really um, addressing the issue of um, um, trust um, in the space and bringing in people to digital to the digital economy for the first time. You know, it comes with its own challenges, um, challenges of awareness, challenges of, um, of consumer protection um, and all that. But, but so far, so good. Um, um, we, we are still um, rolling out. Um, we'll be one on 25th of um, um, October. And we're seeing the awareness um, is increasing, and we're, we're 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 basically discussing with the MSCs and the customers to look at incentive that will facilitate um, adoption. Of course, we know um, we need business cases that will drive sustainability for the MSCs. We're also discussing that. So so far, so good. Um, we believe the inner is going to address uh, most of these frictions that I've seen before now. Thank you. Mm, no, interesting. And uh, we should watch this space to see how it goes. It's only a year old. And one, one thing that you mentioned to me that I thought was interesting to note is that in launching the digital era, 
it was an opportunity for you to bring together a number of the different uh, branches of government that affect MSEs and have a real discussion about how to launch this currency uh, and do it in a way that it is supportive of the small business environment. Um, and bringing together different branches of government, we all know, is a, it can be a challenge. So hats off on that one. Uh, Pale, we've talked of the issue of trust has come up. Um, this is so critical to the success of any, any digital economy. We've been talking about this for years. What <laughs> are the most important steps we need to be taken to get MSEs to transfer from the uh, uh, real world into the virtual world for their businesses? Yeah, so I think the reason we haven't made the progress we'd want when it comes to the trust front, Stella, is that we see it often in, in frankly a reductive manner as a skills issue. So if we teach digital skills, everyone will trust. And that's, that's actually a fallacy. We have to recognize that digitalization is fundamentally about behavior change. And so it's not just about skilling. It is about really creating that trust. And it's about creating the support. So not just putting the onus on small businesses to learn how to, to, to use computers or to learn how to use mobile wallets. Um, and so we at the center have been experimenting with different blends of touch and tech, because what we recognize quite early on is that you actually do need some degree of touch to actually drive digitalization. So you can't just have a purely technologically based modality. And so in India, we ran an RCT where we looked at women entrepreneurs and their um, adoption of certain technologies around their inventory, around their sales, around digital payments. And we tried three different things. We tried to do purely, um, purely tech, um, where they just got sent videos, instruction, um, instructional videos. We did a second cohort that got like one webinar in person and one meeting in person and then the videos. And then we did uh, a cohort that had very high touch support. And what we found, Stella, is that the purely digital cohort, there was 0.5% adoption when it came to the technologies. But when we looked at the high touch cohort, it was 26% adoption. And so I think one of the things we have to think about as organizations that support entrepreneurs is how do we get that blend of touch and tech right? And I would say that our work has really shown that this is especially true when it comes to women entrepreneurs. When we transition to fully digital modalities, our women entrepreneurs weren't engaging as um, as much as they were in person. And so I think as we're talking about trust, we have to recognize it's not just a here's a curriculum, go learn it, you'll you'll adopt it, you'll digitize. There's actually a kind of a give and take and there needs to be really active support. And again, that blend of touch and tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Stephen, you put a lot of emphasis on uh, cybersecurity. What steps have you taken in Nigeria that can help build trust? By? Um, um, th th thank you very much um, um, on that. Again, on, on, on tech and touch, um, just a bit on that. Um, um, just, just to let you know, in Nigeria, we're actually looking at that concept to drive uh, digital financial service adoption as well. Um, we invested heavily in expanding um, our, our agent network, and we've seen the impact on the adoption of DFS. Remember, I said we moved from um, 3% to 28%. These are some of the measures that we're really seeing here that is helping us. Um, for cybersecurity um, um, specifically, um, when you look in the landscape, almost all countries have a cybersecurity um, 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 framework, uh, the data, and I'm uh, looking at data protection um, as well. Um, but what is very important in, in cybersecurity is indeed the message. And the message is clear. Everyone has um, a responsibility, you know. Um, technology will have countermeasures, but everyone is responsible. The service provider has a responsibility for awareness, for consumer protection, and for, uh, you know, to address these issues at their rise. But what we've seen is um, most of these providers just have a typical um, um, customer experience person that knows how to address normal challenges, you know. But th these are some of the things that service providers need to look at in this um, era uh, because um, the adoption of digital 
will really reduce the cost of operation. It would be nice to think towards investing some of these costs in awareness, you know, and in in in, in um, redesigning um, your approach to addressing customer issues and not having one size fits all um, customer service for everyone because cybersecurity it's that big. You know, we're talking about trust, and for um, a lot of these 38 million people, a lot of them will come into the financial services space for the first time um, through digital. Now, one bad experience um, will really, really uh, um, be a trouble for the entire um, ecosystem. So in terms of functional cybersecurity framework is good. We've seen that in this space. A lot of people do have it, and, and there's a lot of discussion around cybersecurity for um, the unbanked, which is also good. But to look at the conversation from a social technical perspective and, and you know, um, starting from the from the point that everyone has a responsibility um, and will really help and saving some of this, using some of this cost saved from um, um, operations and putting into awareness and some of these things will really help um, um, trust in the ecosystem. A multifaceted approach and one that has to be uh, done by government, by the regulators, and indeed by the uh, platform owners themselves. Um, let me uh, just bring in the uh, some questions we're getting from the audience. I think perhaps this one would be for you, Javier. Uh, there's a question who's asking to uh, know more about what's being done in Mexico to bring the informal economy onto the platforms, where about 50% of the economy is uh, um, informal. Um, so what steps are being taken there, particularly in an environment where there are, as you mentioned earlier, some of the, the, the corporate players are starting to dominate? Yeah, one thing that is important, uh, and it's in the discussions in Mexico, the industry is asking themselves this question, the policymakers are asking themselves this question, but it's true across many emerging markets, is the degree to which taxes and, and tax Schemes that can feel burdensome to micro entrepreneurs uh, become a barrier for digitization, not only for e-commerce but but digitization in general, um, digitization of payments and business. So um, I think one important uh, step forward that governments and policymakers can take is to uh, make sure that it is proportional that there is a, a tax scheme that enables an easy entry and formalization of businesses uh, at a very low cost so that the long tail, the bottom end of, of the economy uh, feels comfortable transitioning into a formal environment, tax paying environment uh, that doesn't have an important cost but brings them into visibility, right? It, it uh, for from the policy perspective, um, the problem one one of the big problems with informal uh, the informal economy is that you can't see it. You just know it's there and it's big, but you can't do anything with it. You don't know what it is. You can't see it, right? If if there was an, a, a, an appropriate tax scheme that enables that long tail to come in, uh, would have significant uh, positive. Um, levers for policy making um, and would make it uh, a, a lot easier for um, for the bottom end of the the big bottom end of the economy to participate uh, in the economy participate in the uh, upcoming digital economy thanks very much um hey i know you wanted to pick up on a point uh, about agent networks that stephen just made so yeah i did um because another thing that we've seen when it comes to the trust paradigm and, and stephen's point around agent networks is so important is that entrepreneurs are much more likely to trust each other than top-down authority and so one of the things that we have seen especially in the middle east north africa and indonesia is that the power of peer networks and the power of peer mentoring when it comes to digitalization is incredibly robust and incredibly powerful. And so that model of financial service providers having agents um, is a really important one for us to learn when we think about digital platforms, because you know, those are their trusted advisors. Same with thing with peer mentoring. And so as we think about mechanisms to really foster trust in the digital economy, I just wanted to make sure that we, we, made, we made sure we th thought about peer mentoring. 
thank you. Uh, so let's try pulling some of these threads together. We've gone in a number of different directions, looking at the role of providers, the role of government, the role of consumers. And I think we could keep on talking for a couple of hours before we, we get there. But um, really from your comments and what the uh, audience also is saying, we're looking at a number of different models, which are going to be different in different countries, depending upon where they are in their stages of development. Uh, but I think we all agree that there's this rebalancing of power that needs to happen, an interjection into the marketplace. Otherwise, it's going to tend to aggregate toward the corporate model, which is not going to pull in to the full extent that would be possible the MSEs and, and make it compare. Uh, 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 profitable for them to engage. So let me go through each of you and give one or two of the most important steps that you think need to be taken um, by the various sectors in order to catalyze the growth of the digital economy for MSEs. Uh, so Stephen, would you like to start with government? What are the two or three things that at most that government could do that would most move the ball forward over the next decade? Um, 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 thank you very much. Um, um, the first thing is um, uh, looking at um, the, the, the platform economy and digitization generally. I think the government should focus on its long-term vision and the benefit it can derive um, from this um, because um, government are also looking at revenue. So there's a temptation um, to look at this as um, a way to get more revenue while hurting long-term growth and, and, and admittedly affecting the growth of SMEs. But if, if government to understand the long-term benefits of um, digital platforms coming into the country, the benefit they can derive and the risks and putting um, things on ground to address them, that is going to be very, very helpful. Um, um, secondly, um, the big platforms will come and they are a massive competition for the MSMEs. They are going to get more data, they are going to get um, 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 stronger. And, and you know, um, government generally should work towards providing a level playing ground um, for um, MSMEs, even as large platforms um, 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 coming. And government should look at existing regulation um, to make them suitable to address um, these new scenarios um, 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 that we're seeing and encourage collaboration within various um, 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 ecosystem. And, and I know that, that in, in various countries, there are a lot of platforms that provide for um, everyone to sit down and really discuss um, the future. In Nigeria, for instance, we have platforms where the, the, the telco providers, um, the financial service providers, and everyone really, even the MSMEs um, groups, the uh, MSME um, associations, you know, sit there and issues are, are, are discussed in that way. Everyone understand their roles, everyone understand their responsibility and the risks involved. And, and, and I really believe there are benefits to gain in it if it's well um, looked into and, and addressed. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Pale, looking at the private sector, what are the couple of key steps that need to be taken? Yeah, I'd say a couple things, Stella. One is that we have to make it simple. At the moment, so much of the onus sits on the shoulders of entrepreneurs. And so as an ecosystem, we have to make things simple and we have to coordinate amongst each other because I feel like there's a lot of duplication and replication. Um, and then the second, and I'm thinking specifically about financial service providers here, um, there's such an imperative to be segment intentional. Um, I work a lot with women entrepreneurs. It's incredibly important to think about the barriers that women entrepreneurs face. So for example, one of the things we're doing is working with a lender in Pakistan, and we've worked with the lender to agree to use bold jewelry as collateral because most of the women and entrepreneurs don't have the land title or the deed the title on their house and those sorts of things. So I think one, we have to make it simple, and two, we really have to think creatively and intentionally about specifically underserved segments. Excellent. Javier, where are the big gaps in our knowledge? Where do we really need to focus our research in order to catalyze the future of MSEs? Well, I think there's there's many many places where we I could make the case that we need more uh, emphasis. Um, my my sense is that um, looking at the trajectory of e-commerce and the potential 
effect it could have on economic development and the growth of the MSC sector. Um, I think it's important to bring the to bring finance into the picture. It's not just about the evolution of digital commerce or or the you know of the verticals themselves, but finance is a big enabler of the growth that is expected to happen. There's no upside if there is no finance. Um, so finance is both an, ena an enabler and the result of a, a positive transition into a digital economy. Um, so I think we need to take a, a bigger perspective and and be clear um, or um, make sure we understand the role that finance plays both enabling um, the transition to a digital economy, but also reaping the benefits for the smaller and, and micro entrepreneurs. Javier, Pael, Stephen, thank you so much. I feel we've only just scratched the surface here, but I think you've raised some fascinating, really interesting issues. I uh, very much appreciate your participating in this, this discussion on the future of MSEs in the digital economy.